After centuries of persecution and oppression, European Jewry found hope in the liberal movements of the 1840s, which opened social, cultural, and economic opportunities. This romantic era culminated with the spring revolutions of 1848 throughout Europe. The Jewish fight for emancipation had begun, engaging the whole spectrum of denominations in the new political ideology. Jews stand up not just for equal rights, but for a more humanist and modern Europe. But darkness overcomes the light. The liberal and democratic initiatives are crushed brutally. Many are left without hope and choose to leave the old continent behind, putting their faith in a new home, America. Their idealism traveled with them. Some became active in the abolitionist movement, fighting alongside John Brown. In 1861, when the Civil War erupts in the United States, many of these new American Jews respond to the Union's call to arms, their European combat experience critical in a country with no standing army, rising the ranks and contributing to the Union's ultimate victory. History calls them the Jewish 48ers. Decades after the Napoleonic Wars, amid the Industrial Revolution, 19th century Europe saw rapid economic and cultural development. Inspired by the 1789 French slogan of liberty, equality, fraternity, absolute monarchs are challenged and overthrown. Demands for social change from the street to the elite become violent uprisings in 1848 across Central Europe. Popular uprisings break out across the continent, having a profound impact on the Jews in German regions and the Austrian Empire's Hungarian and Polish realms. Some rebellions evolve into independence movements. For the perennially disenfranchised European Jews, 1848 is the beginning of the fight for emancipation. They are amongst the first to the barricades, then fighting in uniform on the front lines. How did the Jews become involved in reform and rebellions? The 1848 Hungarian Revolution provides an answer. The first Hungarian commercial bank of Pest was a product of the pre-revolution reform age. It was founded in 1841 by a Jew, Morik Ullmann, who went on to finance the first Hungarian railways, which became part of Hungary's modern identity. Ullmann was born in 1782 in the town of Pécs. The young Ullmann was a successful tobacco trader and wholesaler before his banking and finance career. Ullmann died in 1847 before the revolution, but still played a major role in its finance. Other Jewish community members facilitated Hungary's economic autonomy within the Austrian Empire, such as Moore Fischer, who founded Hungary's porcelain industry. Historians say there is no revolution without music. In the 19th century, it was how ideas were spread through the populace. Dances, folk melodies, and military songs transmitted and raised spirits. Popular musician Mordechai Rosenthal was born in 1788 in Balashe Yarmat. Identifying as Hungarian, he changed his name to Roshavolgi and invented the unique folk dance style of Chardash. Roshavolgi died before the revolution but was so inspirational, the Austrians suppressed Chardash long after crushing the revolt. Roshavolgi's son, Jula, served as a first lieutenant in the 1848 Hungarian Revolutionary Army. Jula later owned a successful music publishing business in Budapest. An estimated 300,000 Jews were living in Hungary in 1848 out of a total population of 10 million. Hungarian Jews had limited rights since medieval times. They were prohibited from carrying weapons. A few were granted the privilege to wear swords as the Hebrew script on the 17th century saber suggests. It was the holy sword of Hungarian Jewry in 1848, 
a symbol of their fight for freedom, and can be seen today at the Hungarian Jewish archives in Budapest. Historically, Jews were apolitical, primarily because they had fewer rights than the meager ones granted to the general population. Taking sides usually resulted in retribution by the prevailing powers. The desire for emancipation grew amongst all Jewish dominations since their first taste during the Napoleonic era. They wanted to have equal rights. So the revolutions that would occur, really beginning after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, this uh, trend uh, occurs that it happens in the 1830s. Of course, the big revolutions throughout Europe Judaism itself was undergoing progressive change. The reform movement originated in Germany and was espoused by charismatic rabbis such as David Einhorn and Samuel Holdheim. The new liberal approach spread with the revolutionary ideals and resonated with Hungarians, notably Rabbi Ignaz Einhorn, later known as Edward Horn. European Jewry was uniting politically and asserting itself, but reviving ancient fears in the process. Jewish support for the Hungarian revolutionary cause was a new and complex situation. Their privileges granted by the Austrian crown in the late 1780s had not kept pace with the world around them. Participating in the struggle for an independent Hungary offered hope for Jews as stakeholders with a voice in the nation's destiny. It was worth the risk of Austria's wrath. Reform rabbi and 48er Ignaz Einhorn recalls how the Jewish communities were targeted in the winter campaign by Austrian General Windesgratz. Many of these people were attracted to Reform Judaism uh, because Reform Judaism offered them a way in which to live and to participate in modern European society. Despite Jewish support in a shared cause, old prejudices rear their divisive heads. In March of 1848, the newly formed Hungarian National Guard denies admission to Jews. Austrian and German artisans feared emancipated Jews as commercial competition. It's widely believed that 1848 was a year of utopia when the freedom lover nations stand together, come together, but it wasn't the case. The reality was different and it was disrupted by anti-Semitic incidents. Anti-Semitic pogroms break out in France, Hungary, and German regions, perpetrated by the revolutionary factions. One of the deadliest occurs in Austrian Pressburg, now Bratislava, Slovakia. Despite violent incidents, the Jews still identify as revolutionary Hungarians and form their own National Guard. The brigade was short-lived as the Hungarian elite quickly realized the importance of Jews to their cause. In response to the pogroms and governmental retribution, the Central Emigration Committee is established in 1848 to facilitate refuge for Hungarian and German Jews in America. In this second wave of immigration, the United States' Jewish population grows from 15,000 in 1840 to an estimated 75,000 by 1850, a five-fold increase, but still less than half a percent of the population. 1848-49-es forradalom és szabadságharc idején a zsidók részvétele, tehát az európai zsidók részvétele a magyar szabadságharcban rendkívüli volt és páratlan. Azt megelőzően ugyanis nem viselhettek fegyvert, nem állhattak be katonának. At age 18, Adolphus Hübsch was one of the young Jews who took up arms against the Austrian crown, rising to the rank of lieutenant. After leaving Europe, he will become a prominent figure in American progressive Judaism as rabbi of Ahavat Chesed in New York. Hungarian revolutionary leader Lajos Kossuth praised the Jewish contribution to their cause. Generals Gerge and Ploka spoke highly of Jewish troops under their command. Kossuth estimated the number of Jewish soldiers at between 20,000 and 35,000. Records at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati suggest there were as many as 50,000 Jewish combatants, but estimates may include non-Hungarian Jews from Poland and Germany. Polish General Joseph Bem's Volunteer Legion included many Jews, one of whom was Michael Halprin, 
an early and passionate supporter of the 1848 cause. Heilprin's friendship with Lajos Kaschut and other senior Hungarian ministers made him a target for Austrian Habsburg retribution. He made his way to America, arriving in 1856. After witnessing the cruelty of slavery in the United States, Heilprin becomes an ardent abolitionist, invoking biblical arguments and anti-slavery articles. Through rabbinical debates on slavery, Heilprin meets David Einhorn, the German reform rabbi expelled from Hungary in the early 1850s. Emperor Franz Joseph felt the Jewish reform movement fomented progressive ideas and revolution. Many are left without hope and choose to leave the old continent behind, putting their faith in a new home, America. By the end of 1849, most of the revolution and independence movements have been defeated by the Habsburg armies and their allies. The intervention of Tsarist Russia crushes the last Hungarian hopes for press freedom, civil liberties, tax and land reforms, and abolishing feudal serfdom. Példátlan megtorlás következett, rendkívül sok embert végeztek ki, vagy adott esetben vették el a vagyonukat, és ezzel összefüggésben, ez elől menekülve nagyon sokan emigráltak is Magyarországról. For the defeated, the options are brutal oppression or emigration. America offers a beacon of hope. The voyage was long, harsh, dangerous and expensive. It began with land journeys to the ports of Northern Europe and England. Some remained in transit longer than intended as funds and health ran out. Between 1848 and 1860, more than 50,000 European Jews arrived in the United States for a new life and some of the freedoms they fought for at home. Veterans their families and rabbis all sought better opportunities in America. They're feeling a pull to the new world. Why are they being pulled to the new world? They're being pulled to the new world because publications have been issued uh, in various European languages. religious leaders of the liberal movements here, uh, Jewish religious movements in America, the liberal movements in America. Here I'm speaking about men like uh, Rabbi Dr. Adolf Hübsch or uh, the, the distinguished rabbi and scholar Alexander Kohut, uh, both of whom were from Hungary. The slavery prevalent in the American South was akin to the serfdom the 48ers took up arms against. Slavery is against Judaism, Michael Halprin, David Einhorn, and others argued. There are no exact figures for the Jewish 48ers who fought in the American Civil War, but their numbers are probably higher than contemporary estimates. Religion was not generally asked on government documents. Jews and even Catholics were not yet significant minorities in the United States. Many considered themselves proud, but defeated German, Hungarian, Austrian, or Polish nationals, and secondarily as Jews. Regardless of national origin, some German speakers with German surnames were often categorized as German soldiers. European manuscripts and birth records are yielding more accurate estimates. Contemporary anecdotal sources also provide insight, such as Major General Oliver O. Howard's response to historian Simon Wolf. I had a Jewish aide-de-camp, one of the bravest and best, in the first battle of Bull Run. He is now a distinguished officer of the army, a man of high scientific attainment. I had another aide who was killed in the battle of Chancellorsville, a true friend and brave officer. Two of my brigade commanders who answered to the above description, one of whom you have mentioned, served ably and faithfully at Gettysburg and in the other great battles of the war. So many of the German officers and men, the Poles and the Hungarians, were of Jewish lineage that I am unable to designate them. I can assure you, my dear sir, that intrinsically there are no more patriotic men to be found in the country than those who claim to be of Hebrew descent. 
The 48ers had valuable military experience. They identified with the Union's cause, as it resonated deeply with what they had already shed blood for. America adopted them, and they, in defending its Union, were not going to suffer defeat again. They come over and they bring with them the values and the ideals that uh, became known as the uh, ideology of the 1848ers, the 48ers. Southern secessionists ignited the American Civil War in April of 1861 by shelling Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Despite escalating tensions, the United States did not raise an army prior to the attack. Skilled commanders, veteran officers, and training cadre were in short supply. The European 48ers, Gentile and Jewish, respond to the Union's call, bringing with them valuable military experience. Initially, the Union Army, with more recruits and resources, was poorly trained and led, ceding the initiative to rebel Confederates, resulting in disasters such as the First Battle of Bull Run. Some 48ers played an important role in that battle, covering the Union's retreat. One was Commanding Officer Julius Stahill, who was later promoted to Major General. Jewish 48ers formed the backbone of many new Union regiments. The 11th and 79th Indiana Infantry, commanded by General Frederick Neffler. The 39th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment, organized by Frederick G. Utasi. And the Vermont Brigade, led by General Charles Mundy. Russian anti-Semitism deprived Lieutenant Leopold Blumenberg of his earned military decoration. He relocates to Baltimore, joining the local reform congregation. In 1861, Blumenberg joins the Union Army, helps organize the 5th Maryland Volunteers Regiment, and later rises to the rank of general. Materials at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati detail Blumenberg's contribution to the Union's war effort, as well as criticism of his harsh Prussian standards of military discipline. Remarkably, Blumenberg receives support from President Lincoln, who focuses on results. Blumenberg at Baltimore, I think he should have a hearing. He has suffered for us and served us well, had the rope around his neck for being our friend, raised troops, fought, and been wounded. He should not be dismissed in the way that disgraces and ruins him without a hearing. Yours truly, A. Lincoln. The July Battle of Gettysburg devastates both sides, but this is where the war pivots to Union advantage. There, Edward S. Solomon, a 26-year-old German-Jewish colonel in the 82nd Illinois Regiment, also known as the 2nd Hecker Regiment, distinguishes himself with bravery and skill. Confederates shoot two horses out from under Solomon, but miraculously, he's not even wounded. He was the only soldier at Gettysburg who did not dodge when Lee's guns thundered. He stood up, smoked his cigar, and faced cannonballs with the sang-froid of a Saladin, said fellow German 48er, General Karl Schurz, about Solomon. Solomon was appointed Brevet Brigadier General in 1864 and became the regiment's permanent commander on March 13, 1865, for the last month of the war. Solomon would then serve in Western politics as governor of the Washington Territory and then a California legislator. The unique Jewish experience in the Civil War is documented in contemporary manuscripts, military reports, and other accounts. Europeans fleeing persecution brought an empathy for the oppressed in a country where discrimination would not be criminalized for another century. 48er Ignatius Kapner commanded the 3rd Regiment U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery and most likely had Jewish roots. The American military, segregated until 1947, did not permit African Americans to be commissioned officers during the Civil War, though some served provisionally. Over 186,000 black soldiers did serve, commanded by white officers. Kapner treated his black soldiers with a respect and concern rare for the era, assuring that they were properly trained, fed, and battle ready. Kapner is listed with his men at the African-American Civil War Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. 
After the war, Kapner became friends and business partners with Jewish-Hungarian newspaper publisher Joseph Pulitzer. Circumstantial evidence in Hungary and the U.S. indicates paternal Jewish roots for Szeged-born Major General Julius Stehel. Stehel, born as Samwald, a surname with Ashkenazi origins, was a book trader in Hungary. A recently discovered 1876 article in the American Israelite asserts Stehel's Jewish origins. Stehel was a lieutenant in the Austrian military before joining the revolutionaries. His Union Army command consisted primarily of German-Americans he recruited in New York. The unit and its officers built an impressive record with their experienced 48ers, amongst them Franz Siegel and Louis Bleckner. Stahill rose rapidly from Lieutenant Colonel to Major General. Stahill's first major operation was to cover the Union retreat at the First Battle of Bull Run. His competence mitigated the disaster. Stahill commanded different regiments throughout the war. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor personally by President Lincoln for leading his men to victory in the Battle of Piedmont, despite two bullet wounds. At 87, Stahill was the second oldest Major General when he died in 1912. He's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Newspaper accounts say his funeral was organized by a Meyer Cohen and that most of his pallbearers were Jews, one of whom was Jewish military historian Simon Wolfe. While many 48ers served as field grade commanders, recently discovered papers illustrate the stories of non-commissioned officers, one of whom was Aaron Marx, a German Jew who settled in Ohio, as did other 48ers. Marx fights through the war as a sergeant and after becomes Cleveland's first Jewish police officer, retiring after 27 years. Many Hungarians begin to come to America at this time, and uh, they come in waves, and uh, they make remarkable contributions in numerous places in American society. So uh, one is that many of them will become very important to the North during the Civil War. They join with non-Jewish Hungarians who come to this country and who are committed to liberalism and committed to democracy and who are opposed to slavery and opposed to the ideals of oppression they felt were enshrined in uh, the life of the American South. And uh, many of these Hungarians who had uh, much experience as fighters in the revolutions of 1848 would play a very important role in, in uh, military in the North during the Civil War. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, about 150,000 Jews were living in America. At least 10,000 Jews fought in the war, 3,000 for the Confederacy, and 7,000 for the Union Army. This number is expected to increase as more European birth documentation is examined. Adolphus Adler was a Hungarian Jewish 48er and a colonel in Brigadier General Henry Wise's Confederate Regiment. Wise had no prior military experience and depended upon competent subordinates for success. Adler's engineering qualifications also served him well. Despite Adler's military success, his reputation is ruined after he challenges a Richmond, Virginia newspaper editor for printing a virulent attack on the Jews of the South. Adler prepares for a duel, but it's preempted by the editor's apology. Adler shows there's a cost to libeling Jews as cowards but he too pays a price. Imprisoned by the Southern military for threatening to duel, some in the Confederacy suspect that he has treasonous sympathies for the Union. Adler refuses to cooperate with his interrogators, attempts suicide, but then manages to escape, eventually to the North, and joins the Union Army. Unlike Adler, thousands of Jews, including some 48ers serving the Confederacy, fight to the end. One German Jew, Major Adolf Proskauer is cited for his bravery for the rebel cause at Gettysburg. 
The fratricidal nature of the American Civil War even applied to European Jews. Many foreign-born Jews living in the Confederacy opposed slavery. Leopold Carpellis, born in Prague, was one. The Carpellis family in America was divided. Leopold's brother Emil, a convert to Christianity, will fight with the Confederate Army. Prior to the war, Leopold Carpellis gains tactical experience in encounters with Native Americans as a Texas Ranger. That service gives him an advantage over other recruits when he joins the 57th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Carpellis is awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the military's highest decoration for gallantry in the Battle of the Wilderness. The Medal of Honor was created and awarded generously during the Civil War to boost flagging morale. Carpellis received his after the conflict in 1870. The citation reads, while Color Bearer rallied the retreating troops and induced them to check the enemy's advance. It continues stating erroneously that Carpellis was born in Hungary, while Prague was in the Austrian realm of the empire and after the dual monarchy was established in 1867. Paramount to the military was service over specific origins of its foreign-born heroes. Leopold Carpellis wasn't the only Jew who received the nation's highest military award. Research into the names of Medal of Honor recipients that suggest Jewish origins confirms that at least three others share that honor. Abraham Cohen and David Urbanski of Germany, and Benjamin Levy, the only American-born of these four soldiers. Urbanski's Medal of Honor is displayed at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. I decided to dedicate my life to the ideals of progress and freedom. I never deviated from this decision during the course of my long life, a life rich in stormy events. August Bondi. The role of Jews in the pre-war abolitionist movement had been a footnote until recent research added significant details. The struggle against slavery was fought by Jews across the orthodox reform ideological spectrum. August Bondi was amongst at least three Jews documented with John Brown's armed raiders freeing slaves together. Bondi, an Austrian, was enthralled by the ideology of the Hungarian Revolution. As a well-educated teenager in 1848, Bondi fights in the Vienna Rebellion, but gives up as the Hungarian revolutionary forces do not come to their aid. Marked for retribution, Bondi escapes to America and joins John Brown's militant abolitionists taking part in the bleeding Kansas raids in the mid-1850s. Bondi's fight does not end with Brown's execution. He serves as a sergeant in the 5th Kansas Cavalry, wounded in action three times. After the war, Bondi continues as an observant Jew, speaking about his motives and experience in the abolitionist movement, saying, My parents always impressed upon their children that Jews or Christians, high or low, are all children of a common father. These principles affected my conduct all through life. While keeping a strictly Jewish house, my parents favored my knowledge of other religions. I had read the New Testament before I was eight years old. I could not, under these conditions, help forming my mind according to the commands of Moses. Thou must love the Eternal, thy God, and thy neighbor as thyself, enthusiastic Jew and lover of humanity. The Jewish 48ers embody a multicultural America, Frederick George Utasi, an Austrian lieutenant, defects to fight with the Hungarian revolutionaries and later beside Giuseppe Garibaldi to unify Italy. In 1860, the Utasi family arrives in New York. In May 1861, he organizes and leads the 39th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment, a multinational force of 11 companies composed mostly of 48ers amongst 15 nationalities three Hungarian companies, three German, and one each 
of Italian, Swiss, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Colonel Utasi's brothers, Anthony and Carl, join the unit as his lieutenants. Utasi will later rename the New York 39th as the Garibaldi Guards in honor of his Italian comrade. In June of 1862, Utasi leads a daring attack on the Confederate lines in the Battle of Cross Keys, Virginia. He defends the valley town of Romney with 300 men, earning praise from General Fremont. Colonel Utasi shows extraordinary bravery at Harper's Ferry, too. Utasi rides from one company to another, encouraging his men to fight. He's remembered saying, I will never surrender as long as I have a shot. Other contemporary sources compare him to the Spartan King Leonidas, who would rather die in battle than surrender. Remarkably, the Garibaldi Guard make it through 1862 with no serious casualties. But in March of 1863, Utasi is arrested and relieved of command for selling Union horses for personal gain. The Garibaldi guards are shocked, and the public is divided. Is he a hero or a fraud? Utasi is sentenced to a year in federal prison at Sing Sing, New York, where he quipped, I speak 12 languages. And the guard replies, here at Sing Sing, we speak only one, and we'd like very little of that. The verdict causes a huge controversy. Some believe Utasi's removal from command was politically motivated. But what actually happened? While many of Utasi's men proved excellent soldiers, forging the polyglot Garibaldi guards into a cohesive unit was no easy task. Utasi had to quell violence and occasional mutinies. The companies, organized by nationality, had to coordinate in battle. Issuing commands in seven languages did not fix the problem. So, Utasi forbade German and all other languages, forcing his men to speak only in English. Most of Utasi's German subordinates condemned the Americanization order. While the Germans under his command were disciplined soldiers, there was friction. Utasi witnessed German involvement in anti-Semitic pogroms during the revolutions in Europe. The memory of that crossed the Atlantic. Was Utasi at fault for importing old world conflicts? Soon after his foreign language ban, Utasi issued another unpopular order, forbidding alcohol in the regiment. With his popularity flagging, latent anti-Semitism was another means to undermine Utasi's command. Rumors flew that Utasi was a fraud, a Jew who fabricated his entire past, from his military records to his name, said to be Strasser, and pretended to be a Hungarian noble. These slanders repelled other Hungarian 48ers and motivated support. Brevet Major General Alexander, a non-Jewish Hungarian 48er, testified he knew Utasi in the revolution. But the media was not convinced and echoed the rumors after Utasi's arrest. Utasi's birth name was Strasser. Many Jews adopted Hungarian surnames as a statement of national identification, as new Americans anglicized their names when becoming citizens. Strasser means road in German and translates to Ut in Hungarian. Utasi means of the road or a traveler. Testimony portrayed Utasi as a strict officer who demanded rigid discipline, taking a toll on morale and reflected in desertion rates, especially in the beginning of the war. Fellow Hungarian Jew Emanuel Letterer remembers Utasi as being a tough commander. Letterer, who was promoted to lieutenant for gallantry at the Battle of Cross Keys, wrote, Always the soldiers of other regiments came to admire our clean camps in order. The last hope is a presidential pardon, but Lincoln rejects it, though he calls Utasi one of the best officers despite the circumstances. Some of the regiment's original officers resigned to protest Utasi's arrest. Others quit over the verdict. Hugo Hildebrandt, another Hungarian 48er, takes command and leads the Garibaldis at Gettysburg, where they are key in repelling General Pickett's charge. They retake a lost artillery battery and capture three Confederate battle flags despite serious casualties. Hildebrandt is severely wounded and then discharged from duty. About 10% of the original Garibaldi guards are with the regiment at the war's end, lost through casualty, capture, desertion, and resignation.
The 48ers served throughout the Union Army. Frederick Neffler enters the history books with his heroic charge at the Battle of Missionary Ridge and is promoted to Brevet Brigadier General. Neffler was born in 1833 in Arid, then Hungary, now Romania. About 12% of the city's population was Jewish and most identified as Hungarian. The young Neffler, about age 15, and his father Nathan, a surgeon, joined the Hungarian rebels. Frederick sees much action on the front line and is wounded. After the Hungarian defeat, the family leaves Europe for America, settling in Indianapolis. They are amongst the founders of Indiana's first Jewish congregation, which is still active today. When the war breaks out, Neffler volunteers and, in recognition of his 48er experience, is commissioned as a lieutenant in the 11th Indiana Infantry. He becomes Major General Lew Wallace's Assistant Adjutant General. Wallace, who would later author Ben-Hur in 1880, describes Neffler as prompt and efficient service in the field, adding that Neffler's courage and fidelity have earned my lasting gratitude. Neffler quickly rises in the ranks and is assigned to command the 79th Indiana Infantry. He's described as a humane officer, sharing the agony and triumphs of his troops, and they adore him for it. In the midst of the carnage, in crucial battles such as Pickett's Mill, Shiloh, and Missionary Ridge, Neffler's bravery is noted. While it is out of place, and I feel a delicacy in presuming to dictate as a junior officer, yet I must say that Colonel Fred Neffler, 79th Indiana Volunteers, well deserves and richly merits a commission as Brigadier General for his gallantry displayed in charging and taking Missionary Ridge. Colonel George Dick. 1848 would play a very important role in the uh, military in the North during the Civil War, some of whom would rise to positions of great heights, like uh, uh, General Neffler, Frederick Neffler. When the war ends, Neffler leaves the military for a career in law, rising in Indiana society. As a general, Neffler was one of the highest ranking Jewish officers in the Union Army, certainly the highest ranking Hungarian Jew. But history isn't finished. Colonel Charles Mundy, Assistant Adjutant General of the Division, who led it in person with most conspicuous gallantry throughout all the subsequent movements. With perfect confidence that the troops under his command would follow wherever he would lead the way, he pressed forward in front of the line of battle with a perfect disregard of all danger and by his example, as well as by the skill with which he handled the command, contributed in a very great degree to the glorious achievements that day performed by the Vermont Brigade. Number 127, Report of Brevet Major General Louis A. Grant, U.S. Army Commanding the 2nd Brigade. Charles Mundy is promoted to Brevet Brigadier General for his role in the Vermont Brigade's victory at Petersburg in 1864. Mundy is another young Jewish-Hungarian 48er inspired by revolutionary ideals. He joins the cause, excels as an artillery lieutenant, and promoted to judge of the court-martial in 1849. As the Austrians began executing captured leaders of the revolt, Mundy knew he had to flee Habsburg Europe. In 1850, Mundy makes his new home in Leavenworth, Kansas, and works as a notary. In August of 1861, Mundy volunteers for the Union, rated as a captain, and rises to major in a year. In 1864, at the Battle of Cedar Creek, Mundy is seriously wounded but soon returns to action. Colonel Mundy commands the Vermont Brigade at Petersburg, leading his men in a charge with such audacity that others speculate he's actually drunk. After the Confederate capitulation, Mundy attends gatherings of the Potomac Army veterans, but dies in unexplained circumstances while returning from one on June 4, 1871 in New York. He is survived by his Missouri-born wife, Alice Ryan, and their six children. To define who is a Jew, we have developed 
a strict methodology which we go by. And one of it is the usage of birth certificate, death certificate, Jewish by Simon Wolf, Jewish by Bernstein, Jewish by supportive evidence such as military manuscripts, military reports, or even appendix. <laughs> Forty-eighters are primarily associated with their military roles, but their contributions went beyond combat and training skills. They served as surgeons, scientists, and even spies. In his book, The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen, Simon Wolfe mentions a M. Lully, a Jew who provided significant intelligence for the Union. This was Mono Lully, one of the most successful Union spies who used Hungarian for encryption. 80 years before the World War II Navajo Code Talkers. Joseph Pulitzer was born April 10, 1847, in Mako, Hungary. His father, Philip, fought with the 1848 Hungarian rebels. The Pulitzer family are enumerated as Israelite in an 1850 local census. Young Pulitzer's military ambitions are quashed when he's rejected by the Austrian army and, subsequently, by the British and the French Foreign Legion because of general poor health and vision problems. In 1864, Joseph Pulitzer meets Union Army recruiters in Germany who sign him and bring him to America. Pulitzer will serve in the 1st New York Cavalry Regiment from 1864 to 1865, also known as the Lincoln Cavalry. It is composed mostly of German-speaking immigrants. Pulitzer learns English only after the war and yet becomes the father of modern American journalism. Crusading against corruption, he becomes one of the richest businessmen of the era and establishes the eponymous Journalism Award in his will. Hungarian Joseph Newman also served in a mounted unit, George Armstrong Custer's 7th Cavalry. Newman enlisted as a private and mustered out as a captain in 1865. Many of the Jews of 48 who survived European combat and pogroms gave their lives for America. Marcus Spiegel, an ardent abolitionist and colonel of the 120th Ohio Volunteer Infantry made the ultimate sacrifice. A decorated officer from the 1863 Battle of Vicksburg recovers from wounds but is killed in action the following year when his Ohioans are ambushed. Archived letters between Spiegel and his wife illuminate the story of the Jews in the war and the abolitionist movement. His brother Joseph survives the war and founds the Spiegel Catalog. The role of Jewish 48ers in the American Civil War has only recently received serious academic attention. Finally, their contribution is now being told. Their role in making a more democratic Europe, the Union victory, and the abolition of slavery in the United States is undisputed. After the war, many 48ers continued to apply their ideals to build a more just, and prosperous America in business, arts, and politics. The story of the 48ers, European refugees, countered the myth that one couldn't be both Jewish and a loyal American. They are the freedom fighters of Europe, heroes of the Civil War, and the builders of America. <laughs>